Hi, welcome. My name is Zoe Burkholder, and I am a professor of educational foundations and the director of the Montclair State University Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Education Project here. Um, and we are very excited for our program today, which is called Queering the Past, uh, Teaching New Jersey's LGBTQ History in K-12 through Classrooms. We have a fantastic program um, and some excellent scholars and educators who are going to be working with us here today. Um, Melissa, let's go ahead and go to our next slide, please. All right, we'd like to begin this afternoon by sharing with you the land acknowledgement statement from Montclair State University. So I'm gonna take just a minute to read this. We respectfully acknowledge that Montclair State University occupies land in the Lenape Hoking, the traditional and expropriated territory of the Lenape. As a state institution, we recognize and support the sovereignty of New Jersey's three state recognized tribes, the Ramapo Lenape, Nanticoke Lenni Lenape, and Powhatan Renape nations. We recognize the sovereign nations of the Lenape diaspora elsewhere in North America, as well as other indigenous individuals and communities now residing in New Jersey. By offering this land acknowledgement, we commit to addressing the historical legacies of indigenous dispossession and dismantling practices of erasure that persist today. We recognize the resilience and persistence of contemporary indigenous communities and their role in educating all of us about justice, equity, and the stewardship of the land throughout the generations. Thank you. We are very excited to have this new land acknowledgement statement here at Montclair State University, which has been created in partnership and collaboration with local indigenous peoples in the region. And we are working to expand that partnership through a new indigenous studies minor and new programming and community partnerships. So thank you. All right, moving forward. Melissa, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, terrific. So as I said earlier, my name is Zoe Burkholder. I'm director of the Holocaust, Genocide and Human Rights Education Project. And I'm excited to have some fantastic people with me uh, here today. Professor Danae Davis is here. She is an associate professor of teaching and learning. And I always introduce her as our rock star uh, teacher educator. Her expertise is in preparing teachers to teach meaningful and effective multicultural education um, in different contexts and in different ways, especially at the elementary level. And so Professor Davis is going to start us out this afternoon by telling us a little bit about her own thoughts and ideas about the importance of teaching LGBTQ history. So I'd like to turn the microphone over uh, to Dr. Davis at this time. Thank you and welcome, Dr. Davis. Thank you so much, Dr. Burkholder, for that wonderful intro and happy to be on the panel and hello to the team. Um, as, a, as a former public school educator, I uh, am mindful of the importance of the uh, standards that uh, every state is uh, expects educators to, uh, to implement and use. So I'm gonna uh, leave my comments there. Uh, in 2019, New Jersey required history and perspectives of LGBTQ, uh, actually it was LGBT and disability taught in the middle and high school. In 2020, the New Jersey Department of Education revised its comprehensive health and physical education standards to include inclusive uh, language on sexual orientation and gender identity. Then uh, just under a year later in 2021, Governor Murphy signed a bill, A445, I think that's a four, into law recognizing sexual orientation and gender identification instruction for K through 12. And it's important to start at the younger uh, ages as students are coming into education as they're beginning to learn because we know how key a foundation is and how key a solid foundation is. But just because you have a law doesn't mean people are going to implement. And there's a lot of research about why uh, the um, implementation of this aspect of uh, difference, diversity, and content doesn't happen. Three reasons I'll leave with you. And I think it's a wonderful segue to our presentation, our workshop today. One. There are educators who have personal and professional perspectives on why they won't implement the content. Second, educators don't know where to find the content. Third, people are afraid. They uh, fear reprisal from families and also from communities. And then uh, fourthly, 
the state, although says that these are mandates, doesn't necessarily provide um, precise curriculum. So that's why we're here. And today's workshop is designed to provide you with resources, perspective, so that you will become a rock star educator in your classroom uh, in teaching and being mindful of LGBTQ diversity and difference. Thank you so very much for being here and uh, I hope you have a great time. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna jump in here if that's all right with you, Zoe, and just welcome everyone. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you, Zoe, for having us today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. If you haven't already, um, I'd love to just see where you're coming from and what you teach in the chat box. Uh, I'm also curious a little bit about like what brought you here today. So if you wouldn't mind sharing a bit, if you're comfortable in the chat box about just like what brought you here, what do you hope to learn or gain from this session? Um, feel free to share that as we're introducing ourselves and walking through the beginning of the session. Um, my name is Melissa Mott. I am the founder of We Are History, which is an initiative that trains teachers in LGBTQ issues in the classroom uh, in using primary sources that are very local, very place-based, um, and very historical. I'm a former 10th grade teacher in North New Jersey. I'm from Somerset County. Uh, in my day job, I run a genocide education program, um, and I'm really thrilled to be joined today by the Queer Newark Oral History Project. And so I'm going to pass it on to my colleague Scott and then Kristen to introduce themselves before we move forward. Hi, everybody. My name is Scott Hirschfeld. I'm really pleased to be here with you today. I um, work with Melissa um, at We Are History, and my day job is... Um, with the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights, um, a, a curriculum specialist there, and we do uh, education and, and training on a variety of uh, civil rights and anti-discrimination issues. I spent the first 14 or 15 years of my career as um, an elementary and middle school teacher in the New York City public school system. So um, teaching and instruction is, um, uh, you know, at, at the core of my identity and a big part of my heart. So I'm happy to talk about um, instructional issues and um, and school-based issues um, with you today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen. Hi everybody, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Kristen Scorsone. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at Rutgers University Newark in American Studies. Um, I primarily study Newark's LGBTQ plus history and I work with the Queer Newark Oral History Project. Um, and then in terms of teaching experience, I, I teach classes at Rutgers as part of my graduate degree. And then I've also been a substitute teacher in Kearney schools, um, which I love. That was that was great for, for all grades. There were, the little ones are hard, though, so I give you all credit if you're teaching little ones. But um, yeah, I'm glad to be here and I'm going to pass it back to Mel. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, and thanks as well for those of you who are sharing out in the chat box. I see some really interesting answers about what folks are coming here to learn about today. The state not providing folks with a precise curriculum, um, earning different credentialing, learning how to be more inclusive of diverse students, um, talking about LGBT history and health disparities. So some really excellent reasons that have brought us here today. And I just want to go over a little bit about um, where we're headed and ground us in a shared understanding of LGBTQ issues. So first and foremost, we're going to set a rationale today. Why do these issues matter? Why does it matter to talk about them? Um, and how do we do so, right? We'll work on understanding the basics of uh, unerasing LGBTQ history, um, look at some really key events in this sort of historical canon of LGBT history and LGBT rights, establish a basic timeline. And one of the most unique and the most challenging aspects of LGBTQ history is that it's not aggregated in a linear fashion, right? It didn't happen in just one contained period of time. It happened disparately without a container or a major social movement. So it could be incidents just a few years ago, it could be incidents 200 years ago. And so we're hoping today to give you a variety of different ways to incorporate LGBTQ history into your curriculum um, and understand the sort of basics of what unerasing history looks like uh, via a, a key insight into the Queer Newark Oral History Project. Um, and since LGBT history is not bound together by a specific religion or an ethnicity or a cultural marker, right, not all LGBTQ people are the same, period. Um, it's important to help students to draw connections between 
uh, LGBTQ history and other histories to create a sort of shared narrative of the past, right? We're going to be focusing today a lot on oral histories in order to do this um, and looking at them as a primary source to help us to understand how to be both like standards aligned, right, um, and put students uh, in sort of in possession of the raw materials of history uh, and to look at history firsthand and how it happened to people. Um, and also understand how oral histories can help us to tell these erased versions of the past, right? Um, and lastly, we're going to practice an activity on LGBTQ history and identity and really look at, again, this local lens um, with Kristen's uh, presentation and discussion about the Queer Nork Oral History Project uh, as a way to really help students understand that LGBT history, again, isn't confined to one single narrative, either of whiteness or of a coastal sort of elite version of history or of Stonewall or of Harvey Milk. Um, we really want to expand students' understanding of what queer issues are, how history happened, um, and how it happened specifically here, right, uh, in New Jersey, in Newark, in the surrounding areas, and understanding those links with their lives, right? So again, we'll, we'll, we'll end with really just dialing down on the local aspect of this history. So... I'm gonna ask as well, just for some technical issues, if you could A, mute yourself, um, you probably already muted, B, um, if you have questions, which are great, we encourage questions, please ask them, like, please feel as though you can ask them. You can either put them into the Q&A function. I would suggest actually putting them into the Q&A function, uh, then we won't lose them over the course of the session, but please feel free to ask questions. We can come back to a parking lot and Q&A at the end of the session. So we'll start with like, who are the LGBTQ people? And I'm only going to spend just a minute or so on this because I want us to really get into the meat of history. Um, you'll notice I have just a couple of like fun pictures here of different LGBTQ people throughout time. Um, here I have Harvey Milk. I have Frank Kameny over there. I have uh, Marcia P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. And, you know, we just want to start at the very beginning, right? Um, LGBTQ people, as I said, are not bound by a particular cultural marker, an identifier, um, and so define themselves or define ourselves in a variety of different ways, right? Um, from lesbian to gay to pansexual, queer, questioning, gender non-binary, um, terms are constantly evolving in the LGBTQ community and they will continue to evolve. They are a reflection of queer people's uh, reclamation of various terms, and they are also um, a key element in understanding and making students feel included. So I'm just putting a little glossary in the chat box for you to take a look at uh, over the course of the session if you have more questions. Um, the main takeaway here is there are many different ways that LGBTQ people define themselves. You do not need to be an expert in every single term to be inclusive in your classroom and to teach about LGBTQ issues proactively. You do have to be committed to being constantly educated and taking in new information in terms of um, exactly how these terms shift and change throughout time and what our students are saying, right? Because there's always something new that they are bringing to us. Um, and in terms of invisibility, I'm going to I'm gonna just kick it over to Scott for, to run our next activity and talk a little bit about where and how LGBTQ people are or are not present in our curriculum. Great. <clears throat> well, we, uh, we wanted to um, start with this, um, this awesome quote by um, <clears throat> the lesbian feminist uh, poet Adrian Rich. And she wrote, when someone with the authority of a teacher describes the world and you're not in it, there's a moment of psychic disequilibrium as if you looked into a mirror and saw nothing. Um, and so we wanted to just ask for your response to um, that quote. What does it bring up for you? You see a couple of prompts there on the bottom. What does Rich mean by psychic disequilibrium? Can you remember ever feeling like this as a student? Or any anything else you want to react to um, in, in the chat box? Um, what does this bring up for you when you when you hear that quote? I'm just going to pause while people compose their thoughts. I'll also say while you're typing that it's amazing we have almost a hundred people who joined us today, which is fantastic. Um, means we won't be able to um, read and respond to all of your comments and questions, but we'll do do our best to to sample um, as many as we can. Okay, 
Jasmine says lack of representation. Christina says ideas of inclusion and belonging to the main narrative, being completely unsure of oneself. Yeah, doubting whether your feelings are genuine. The quote evokes feelings of being invisible, of not mattering, a lack of equality, invalidated as a person, feeling unacknowledged or invisible, not validated. So we're seeing a lot of those repetitive themes of just feeling invisible, isolated, not validated, um, not included, not equal, being disconnected from the from the community around us, from the world around us, distrust into someone who's meant to be on a learning life journey with me, one who's a guy, distrust in what I'll be taught. Um, so I I think I think really there's a um, you can continue to put your thoughts in the chat and read each other's thoughts and comments. It's definitely a lot of um, similar ideas coming up here um, about <clears throat> just just um, the the invisibility um, and isolation that comes from not being reflected, not being represented in the history, in the stories that we tell um, in um, in the in the curriculum. In, in the in the literature that um, we we read and that we learn about in uh, through the school curriculum, so um, not being represented um, is uh, a hugely uh, a powerful a hugely uh, powerful thing in the school curriculum, and I think um, Melissa, we can we can move on to the to the next slide. So. We want to um, further explore this idea of erasure or invisibility in the curriculum that was introduced through the Adrian Rich quote through an interactive timeline activity. So on your screen, you see 10 events in LGBTQ plus history, and your task is gonna to be to put them in chronological order. And the way you're going to do that is through a website um, called Mentimeter. And you can see now that Melissa is switching us over to a website called um, menti.com. And um, what you can do is on your phone or your computer, you can go to menti.com. And Melissa, are you also gonna show the QR code or is that not gonna work in this setup? That's a great question. And I will show the QR code and I hope that it does work. Okay. Um, so, I'm gonna... so you can either just take a quick picture of the QR code, maybe, yes, that's here. Or if that doesn't work for you, you can just go to menti.com. So there it is. You can just capture that uh, QR code. And again, if that doesn't work for you, just go to menti.com. It can be on your phone or your computer. And you're going to put in the code you see on the screen, 24622665. In a moment, Melissa is going to toggle to that website, and you'll see the code again there in case you missed it the first time around. And what you're going to do is try to put these 10 LGBTQ historical events in chronological order. And the way you're going to do it is um, click on the one first that you think came earliest in history, and you'll see that that'll move up. Um, and You'll rank that first, meaning that you think it came earliest, and you'll you'll go on in that way. And the one that you rank last will be the one that you think happened most recently in history. And I'll, I'll let you have just um, a couple of minutes to to go ahead and and do that. <clears throat> and there may be a bunch of events here that you've never heard of that are new to you. That's fine. Um, let's not. We're not gonna. Um, overthink it or worry too much if there are things that are new to you. Just do your best to try to put this in the order that you think these things may have taken place. And as you work, you'll notice the events moving around on the screen. As people log their results, they'll shift around to reflect the order that all of you are selecting. So hopefully... The technology will work beautifully. Looks like it is. And we'll get to see uh, everybody's thoughts live as they come in.
Right, it looks like, okay, we're still moving around a little bit. We slowed down for a while, now we're moving again. Let's take about 30 more seconds. I know that's not that much time, but we just only have a short time together in this session. And after that, that 30 seconds, we'll, we'll show you the answers and process it a little bit. Right, so as we wind down, this will keep moving a little bit as people keep working, but as we wind down, um, take a look at um, what the group as a whole thinks, see how um, it compares with what you thought, and then we'll, we'll switch back over to the PowerPoint and we'll see the actual answers. Okay. So here's the actual answer key. And um, I want to ask you first, just, um, just, just in general, what surprised you or stood out to you? What questions do you have? Um, what came up for you as, you as you worked on this? Any general reactions, questions, or surprises? Hey, Jane says most, of, if not all, have been absent in our history instruction. Um, yeah, certainly when most of us were in school and even, um, uh, even currently for most of our students today, um, most of these are, um, are unknown. Um, sometimes when I've done exercises like these, people feel like it's, a, it's like a trick question or we're giving them like arbitrary or uh, unknown um, events to try to make them feel uncomfortable or trick them. But the fact is that these are these are not trick questions. It's just that we've been taught so little about LGBTQ history that most of us know so little about um, the long and vibrant history of LGBTQ people and events. Um, Frederick says, I guess I'm surprised I don't know about any of these events. Uh, uh, Rashmi says, I'm surprised that the first organization, organization campaigning for the rights of LGBTQ plus people was started so early in 1924. Um, yes, by Henry Gerber, the Society for Human Rights. Um, and yeah, that's, a, uh, that's a, a fascinating history. That organization only existed for a few short months um, because the wife of one of the members of the society turn them in and the the group was shut down um henry gerber was um tried and so are the other members the other members of the group sort of um uh turned against him or left him isolated he went through three trials he was never convicted but he lost his job he lost all of his money um it's kind of a sad story um uh but an interesting story and it's considered the precursor to some of the more modern LGBTQ rights movements that ha that happened after that. So there's a really rich history that most of us know nothing about. Uh, let's see some of the other comments that came up. In 1962 being the year that the first state removed um, uh, sodomy law. Um, uh, yeah, um, a long, long history, uh, hundreds of years in this country of people being penalized, executed, um, thrown in jail or given financial pen penalties for consen consensual adult sex. And it was only, as I think is also in this timeline, taken off of the, it was only overruled by the U.S. Supreme Court um, in 2003, so in the, uh, in the 21st century. And even to today, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 14 states still have it on the books. In other words, um, even though um, the Supreme Court decision overrides those state laws. Maybe in protest, they never removed it from the book. So there's still 
there's still um, those laws on the books in 14 states. Um, they're holding on to those uh, uh, retrogressive uh, views. I didn't know the first openly outspoken transgender person was in 1952. We don't think of Illinois as at the uh, front of this conversation now. I didn't know much of these. And uh, I wish I had hours to, to go through and process um, all of your comments. Uh, somebody says I knew 1962, the 1962 Illinois sodomy law removal because I teach that to my students when we go over an LGBTQ history timeline. Um, yeah, um, I'm equally surprised and not surprised. I never learned any of this. And that was gonna be my next question to you um, was, um, was how many of you, and I'm, I'm gonna ask this anyway, how many of you um, ever learned about any of these events in school? Just as an exercise, if you never learned about any of these in your own schooling, just put none in the chat. If you did learn about this in your own schooling, just quickly put what you learned, you know, um, the thing that you learned about, sodomy laws or just a word. And we can see the vast majority of us have learned um, nothing about, honestly, I don't remember, but probably none. Most of you are saying none. Sometimes- no, really devastating to see yeah, it is right sometimes um sometimes people say like james baldwin is here sometimes people will say i've um, read james baldwin or we talked about his uh, sexual orientation in school um names like harvey milk um or the stonewall riots will come up i learned about those things in school um here somebody says baldwin in the first gay rights demo in 64 so a few people have learned about a few pivotal events, but the majority of us have never learned about LGBTQ plus people history or events in school. Thankfully, today we're in a bit of a more inclusive era. Um, as you heard a little bit earlier, um, New Jersey became the second state in the country uh, to mandate inclusion of these issues in middle and high school uh, curricula. And there are a whole lot more resources now for teaching about these issues than there were when any of us were um, being schooled. So what we want to do now is take a look at one concrete example of a history that has been made largely invisible and that we can unerase in our instruction because there are resources now for um, teaching about these issues in school. This is a very short film clip that we want to show you about Baird Rustin. Uh, Rustin was an unsung hero of the civil rights movement, though he's received um, a lot more attention in recent years. Rustin was a top advisor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was chief architect of the method of nonviolence and a lead organizer of the, not a lead organizer, he was the lead organizer of the 1963 March on Washington. And despite these achievements, he was attacked by Congress and forced out of the civil rights movement for being gay. So this is a very short video clip from a documentary called Out of the Past, and we're going to take a look at this. August 28, 1963, a quarter of a million Americans gathered in Washington, demanding that Congress put an end to officially sanctioned racism. Uh, without Baird Rustin as the organizer, the March on Washington would have been like a bird uh, without wings. It was a sea of humanity. He had the ability to pull people together. He was able to reach out to hundreds and thousands of people all across America. Everybody from the NACP to the Protestant, Catholic, and Jews, he brought us all together. Where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. That afternoon, in the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial, a parade of speakers offered words of inspiration to the crowd. Those spoken by Martin Luther King would be heard over and over again for decades to come. Bayard Rustin's would be all but forgotten. Because of the stigma that attached to homosexuality, most Americans have no idea who he was and what he accomplished. So there's a way that Rustin is really a man without a history and in certain ways is a lost prophet of nonviolence. He was gay 
and we have not had the courage. We have not had what I call raw courage to honor a man because of his sexuality. Gays are beginning to realize what blacks learned long ago. Unless you are out here fighting for yourself, then nobody else will help you. I think the gay community has a moral obligation to continue the fight. Bayard Rustin. All right, and so you see the reflection questions there up on the on the screen. Um, just in a few words or a phrase or a sentence in the chat box, um, maybe you could respond to just one of these. Something something that has stood out to you in the clip um, or a, a thought that you have about um, how students are affected when their histories are are erased before we move on to the to the next section. I see that some of you are saying that you learned about Rustin in school, which is awesome. Uh, others are saying that you were not taught this. MSU presented Rustin with an honorary doctorate in 68, but there's little mention of it. That's amazing. I love that. Lost prophet of nonviolence stood out to me. You know, it's a beautiful phrase, very poetic. Students have one less role model to look up to. Yeah, when we, when, when people like Rustin are made invisible um, in the histories we tell and the stories we tell. Raw courage, yeah, from uh, John Lewis. It's a, great, it's a great statement. A man without a history is also impactful. Raw courage again, unknown because of sexuality, continue the fight. A man with a lost history makes me think about the fact that LGBTQ have always been around, but been purposely erased, very intentionally erased. Um, yeah, um, yeah, these are all great um, comments that you're that you're pulling out. We remember Dr. King and his speech on that day, but have not been taught about Baird Rustin. Yes, very very intentionally um, left out. So. Um, yeah, this is this is a um, uh, a great example. Out of the past is a great documentary. There's another one on Baird Rustin called Brother Outsider. At the end of this program, you're going to get a list of resources um, that will in include <laughs> information about Rustin, Rustin and lots of other instructional resources that you can use in your in your uh, programs. Uh, just just um, winding down as we go back to that Adrian Rich quote that we started this section with. We, we want to describe a world to students through our curricula in which all students can see themselves reflected, right? So representation for LGBTQ plus students and for all groups who have been marginalized in history and in media is incredibly affirming and empowering. And um, I, know, I know all of you are here today because you understand that. And again, um, check out the resources that we're going to share with you later. Um, and we can all find ways to bring this rich material into our um, into our instructional program. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Melissa to take us into the next section. Great. Thank you, Scott. Um, yeah, and I, I, I really appreciate this clip and I appreciate everyone's share out in the chat box um, about students being impacted by ignorance because it breeds misunderstanding um, and this story not being sort of threaded through into the fabric of how we talk about history. Um, so I, I, I appreciate the share outs and thank you. And I'll just quickly say too um, that the timeline activity uh, is very fun to do in a classroom in real life with people in person uh, and organize students according to how they think, have them organize how they, how they think this timeline might look right in a linear fashion. Um, so just a quick mention of that and the fact that the timeline activity will be in, again, your resource um, packet at the very end of our session. Um, so I'm going to just quickly parlay us into like a, a building this foundation, right? That we want to make sure that we have an understanding of why we in our class, like we personally, like me, um, why we are teaching about this history. Uh, what do we want our students to gain from it, right? Um, and what are our fears, our concerns, and our challenges? And I saw some of those in the chat box before, but I'm going to prompt you again with this with this question. So Baird Rustin, again, is just it's one story in this sort of multitude of stories that exist in the historical canon that are about LGBT people and their contributions to history. 
Um, so what's our rationale for creating these inclusive classrooms for LGBT students and teaching these issues? Um, first, let's talk about the desired outcomes in teaching about them. And I really want to reflect on these, right? Uh, what are the things that you'd love to see? What are the things you just like to see? Uh, what are the shifts in your students' mindsets that you might be starting to think about um, as a desired outcome for teaching this history, right? So before we get to the what, we're, we're getting to the why, right? This big question of why we're teaching this. Um, well, we know that it's because we, we have these, these baseline understandings of democratic values, right? We want students to to feel seen. Um, to, to Scott's point before about the Adrian Rich quote, we want to tell a true story about American history. Um, but I, I want to just give us a second and really dial down on for us personally, what are the outcomes we want to see in classroom for all students, uh, not just for LGBTQ students, but for our classrooms writ large. Uh, and simultaneously, like, what are some of the things that we're like, really hoping don't happen, right? Like what are some of the concerns, challenges, et cetera, that you're really hoping are not going to come up? And I'd also welcome you in this section, like just because I haven't heard anyone's voice yet, please feel free to unmute and share, raise your hand um, and, and you can be unmuted and share if you have something that you're really wanting to uh, add to the conversation. And I'll, I'll center us again on the desired outcomes. What do you want out of these lessons? Strengthening communities, I see from Jasmine. Belkis is talking about when a student feels comfortable and safe, then they can learn, um, absolutely, and they can reach their academic goals. Desired outcomes for all students feeling seen and a sense of belonging so that people are free and comfortable to learn. Great. I love these so far. Uh, anything else? Uh, the building of empathy, right, which we know is an important skill. We also know it's an important still, a skill for, for civics education, right, for educating um, students to participate in a democratic society. We know we want to instill within them tolerance and empathy for others, uh, building a strong rapport. Um, Erica is talking about not having any students feel isolated. We want to work with humans who feel valid, just as we feel valid. Absolutely, we want to validate people's existence prevent hate-based violence, um, inclusivity and equality. Um, Christina, I love this point about schools being like a shrunken uh, model of the world, right? Like this microcosm of the, of the rest of the world. So our desire here is to model inclusion so we can bring it outside. It's a really great point, Christina. Making sure students feel heard and appreciated, great. And I'm going to turn us to the next question. Are there fears? Are there concerns? Are there challenges that you're anticipating? I can't I can't pretend that we have all the answers and every concern and fear that you are um, that you might be that you might be considering before you go into the classroom with these lessons. But sometimes it's good to say them out loud so we can begin to find solutions. Right. Yep. Um, parent backlash. Um, scared to accidentally say the wrong thing or offend students. Absolutely. That is, um, that's such a thing. We hear that, Scott and I hear that fairly often about people just want, wanting to make sure they're not offending students or making people uncomfortable. I see a lot about parents um, saying something that's going to come as offensive, right? Opening the floor to students, um, concerned that there might be accidental, hurtful, or ignorant statements. I applaud all of your um, care <laughs> in this group towards making students feel comfortable and seen. Um, offending someone, inclusive education, and answering questions. Yeah, be, students being homophobic or transphobic and making their peers feel unsafe. Ray, yeah, that's a very, that's a real issue, right? Like, that's why before we get to the history, it's so important to create an inclusive classroom or at least to work towards that inclusion. And it might not happen overnight, right? It might take a full school year. It might take several um, years or marking periods of cementing these values within the classroom culture. Um, Scott or Kristen, anything to add before we move on? Um, no, I'm good for now. Cool. Yeah, I think this is great. It's so nice to see everyone being supportive of each other. And I think it's cool to, to know that you all have other colleagues out there that you're all, you know, it's not just one of you trying to do this. You're all here trying to do this thing. Absolutely. Um, first step, good step. 
Um, and so again, just to summarize, A, we want curricular visibility, making sure young people feel seen, and we want that curriculum to be utilized as a window and a mirror, right? I'm sure you all know that and you've heard it many, many times. Um, we want to emphasize learning as this sort of revolutionary act that we can all do together. And for students to understand that American history is made up of a broad number of stories, uh, many of which have been willfully erased. And when they're on a race can lend texture and understanding to how we see the past, right? Um, we don't want them to only see narratives of victimization, especially with LGBTQ people. Um, this is true when you teach any marginalized history, right? We do not want students to only see the past, th those in the past who were oppressed or dispossessed to be seen only as victims. We wanna make sure that we are showing students acts of agency, even if those acts of agency are small or subtle. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, again, dialing down on the C3 framework and, and the pluralism as a democratic value. So a lot of you said this in the chat box, uh, young people understanding that pluralism is important. This maps onto that C3 framework for civics education, civic mindsets, civic values, tolerance, justice, um, the sort of foundation of a social studies classroom. And then concerns, I mean, I think those those are very valid concerns, and I hope we have some time at the end to, to walk through a few of them, um, but it also push us to consider challenges within our own classroom context and our own school ecosystem, right? So maybe with other teachers, with administration, um, and yes, with parents, but with maybe colleagues, right? Unexpected conflicts or unexpected challenges. So I'm going to move us quickly now into I also say, like. Mm -hmm. In terms of that, like it's not just conflicts, but a lot of your coworkers and colleagues and admin are LGBTQ too, as well as parents and guardians. Right, so absolutely. To support your colleagues too. Absolutely, it's it's an act of allyship on top of being an a, an, an act of this like unerasing history, right? So this is a fairly depressing slide that I'll just say at a moment, but I'll say that you know, and you, you many of you have said this in the chat box as well, which is that LGBTQ history and issues are teaching them as a as a quite revolutionary act for students, right? Um, reliable estimates indicate that like a, a large percent of student populations identify as being LGBTQ right now, and the outcomes for LGBTQ students are still quite stacked against them, despite what we see as an upwards trending of a tolerant climate in society. And so teaching LGBT history, working towards inclusive classrooms can help to shift students' learning outcomes in some really major ways. Um, and I'm going to just wrap up before I give it over to you, Kristen, with just talking a little bit about pedagogy and practice. And I'd, I'd ask too now, I've been talking for a bit, so if you have questions, raise your hand, put them in the chat box, you can unmute whatever's going to work for you. Um, we want to be reflexive in the session, even though we only have a short period of time. So in terms of our how we look at pedagogy and practice, there are a few really key principles here. Um, LGBTQ history is a nascent field. It's just being developed. It is being researched. There is historiography going on right now to excavate this history and talk about it. So there's a few things we want to keep in mind. Um, one is to integrate this history into the standard curriculum, right? We don't want to teach standalone lessons that are only during Pride Month or only reactively when something like terrible happens, like the Pulse nightclub shooting or Colorado Springs, right? Instead, we want to try to teach LGBTQ perspectives during various times of the year when we can seek genuine connections. So, for instance, talking about like the lavender scare, which was the firing of LGBTQ people in the government in the 1950s, alongside maybe a unit on McCarthyism or um, teaching the book, I don't know, Fahrenheit 451, if any of you guys are English teachers, right? Um, talking about, let's say, pink lists or targeting queer folks during the Nazi era or the reign of the Third Reich, right? So making these really natural connections to bring LGBT history into your already written standards and your, your units is an easy way to infuse LGBT history. So it's not just like, you know, a thing you do in June at the end of the school year, which is great. You should definitely do a thing in June at the end of the school year, right? Something celebratory, something happy, something embracing humanity. Um, but infusing these real stories throughout the curriculum is just as important. The second bullet point, which we're going to parlay to quickly, is just this aspect of local history. Again, local history helps students to better understand their community, as well as like the inequalities that they can see around them every day, right? So they should learn the, the, the very true fabric of their community, of their state, city, etc., 
And that's the history that has the most direct impact on the trajectory of their lives. And similarly, um, making links to this local LGBTQ history helps people to see themselves as historical actors um, and the past having more historical actors than just like, you know, again, Harvey Milk, um, poor Harvey Milk that I'm that I'm talking a lot about today. So connecting to current events is where I'll, I'll sort of bring us next, which is just this idea that we want to make sure we're linking our conversations about LGBT rights to the broader climate of LGBTQ rights in the world, right? Um, we want don't want students to think that the fight for justice has stopped or is over or has been won. We want to make sure that we are linking always to what LGBTQ rights look like in other places in the country, in other places in the world. Um, and this is, again, just a best practice that I'm sure you all do that is connected to social studies education. Great. Okay. I see a couple of questions in the chat box um, and I'm gonna get, we're gonna get to them in just one second. Um, lastly, using primary sources, real voices, focusing on agency and resistance again, which I, I spoke to before and emphasizing an interconnected perspective of history as well as the intersectionality that exists for many of the queer histories that we talk about. Um, and with that, I'm gonna shut myself up and bring it over to you, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you, yeah, awesome. So uh, again, just thank you all for being here for it. You know, this slide is, you know, on the topic of why does this matter? And I just want to say thank you for it mattering enough to you all to come and learn with us. So, you know, in terms of myself, why does this matter to me? Well, I grew up in, in Kearney, New Jersey um, in the 80s and 90s with very little representation of LGBTQ people in the media let alone, you know, at school, um, you know, I knew Ellen DeGeneres and that's pretty much it. Um, and I certainly didn't know anything about LGBTQ plus history. And yet for me, um, just like two miles from my house, the city of Newark had a vibrant LGBTQ community and a rich history that I had no clue about. Um, I thought I could only find queerness on television or maybe in New York City. Uh, I had no idea that this history was all around me because I was told nothing good happens in Newark. So in the 90s, Newark, you know, many of you will probably remember is it was known as the murder capital of the U.S., right? And the city's stigma as a place of crime and decay meant it was to be ignored. And this also meant I was denied access to a history and a multiracial community of amazing LGBTQ plus people. So my personal and professional devotion to this subject has led me to this work and to being here with you all today. I don't want young people, especially LGBTQ plus youth to not have access to this history like I didn't. And what's evident in the chat that you all didn't as well. Um, you know, when, when we don't have a history, it's easier to delegitimize and devalue us. We also deserve our history because our history is a history of achieve, achievement and survival. So I joined the Queer Newark Oral History Project at Rutgers University Newark in 2015 to help uncover Newark's LGBTQ plus history. Um, and recently I published this op-ed in the Star Ledger um, with a fellow PhD student, Dominique Rocker, because I don't want future generations to have to fight for scraps of their history and because knowing and sharing our history is a life-saving endeavor. So the Queer Newark Oral History Project um, was founded by Darnell Moore, Christina Strasberger, and Dr. Burl Satter. And they decided to meet with LGBTQ plus leaders in Newark to find out what the community would want to see in a history project. And what ultimately was decided on was an oral history project. They wanted LGBTQ youth, that these leaders in, in Newark wanted LGBTQ youth especially to be able to know their history and not have to look to like celebrity culture for it. They wanted young people to see themselves reflected in folks who live locally that they could more closely relate to. Next. So 
Queer Newark documents and preserves the LGBTQ plus history of folks in and of Newark, right? And we primarily do this through oral history. And oral history, if you're not aware, is a method of historical research that involves recording the memories of people, communities, and participants in history. It can provide a new lens on history and society through emphasizing the experiences of ordinary people rather than elites. And it can also be a way to decenter whiteness and let other voices be heard. The oral history process at base level for queer Newark is me, you know, sitting across from another human being and pressing record on a tape recorder and providing the space for them to tell their story and their understanding of the world as they have lived it. By gathering these stories together, we have created a new archive that provides a different perspective on history that hasn't been told before and is publicly accessible on our website. Community members are historical actors and through their experiences, they provide a window into historical events, right? So, you know, looking at oral histories brings up questions like, you know, what did people, uh, how, did make, how did people make sense of what was happening in a time or a place and what might their stories reveal about our society or historical events that won't be found in more like official sources, right? What kinds of themes occur across different stories of the same event? Like if you compare a couple, few people's narratives and um, where do the stories diverge and why? Next. Um, this is as much a local history as it is an LGBTQ one. So, you know, what's more, Newark's LGBTQ plus history is largely an intergenerational history of queer and trans people of color. This is important because even when LGBTQ plus history is uncovered and incorporated into archives and exhibits and books and other media, the focus tends to be on white gay men and to a lesser extent white lesbians despite the many critical ways queer and transgender people of color have contributed to our culture and our survival. So our interviewees uh, for Queer Newark range from artists and activists and entrepreneurs and business owners and religious clergy, directors, musicians, designers, photographers, academics, like you name it, you know, we have trans folks, we have ballroom community, um, even MJ, uh, who is on poses from Newark, unfortunately, we don't have her history, but I just think that's really cool. Um, so uh, studying Newark reveals how much, you know, how so much of local LGBTQ plus activism is led by Black queer and trans people, especially Black queer women. And Newark is not unique in this. Queer uh, and trans history and culture is very much indebted to Black LGBTQ plus people and people of color. Next. And yet, uh, someone said Darnell Moore's memoir, No Ashes in the Fire, is an amazing book. Yes, it is. It is such a great, great book. I listened to it uh, on Audible. It was very good. Um, so because we want to have, we want people to have access to this history, um, we have created different public history projects that draw on our oral history archive. So for one, we provide historical walking tours of the city that are free and open to all. We hold them during the year, depending on the project's capacity, because we are volunteer run. Um, but we always do a walking tour during walking tour during Newark Pride every July. So you could always encourage students to come to that. Um, we also have a virtual version of the walking tour on our website that can also be explored online. Next. Um, we also have a traveling exhibit called At Home in Newark, Stories from the Queer Newark Oral History Project. Um, it was co-curated -cur uh, by graduate students and uh, graduate design students. And the exhibit tells the stories of how LGBTQ plus Newarkers have claimed space for themselves in the city within bars and clubs, um, ballrooms, uh, ballroom culture, I should say, houses of worship, street corners, community centers, um, and artistic venues in the face of poverty, violence, you know, illness and racism, uh, discrimination and that sort of thing. So this exhibit is available if your institution would like to host it. You can always contact us at Queer Newark and put in a request. Um, some of the places it's been on view in the past were the Newark Public Library, um, Audible, and the Campus Center at NGIT. Um, it just sort of got on hold for a bit because of the pandemic, but we're we're looking to to let it travel again. So let us know next. 
Um, a few years ago, I also I decided to produce and host a podcast for Queer Newark because I wanted these stories to reach more people who maybe perhaps wouldn't sit down to listen to some of the oral histories are rather lengthy. So I was thinking, you know, they might not sit down for a long oral history, but they would listen to a shorter podcast episode. So um, the episodes, uh, there's only a few currently, but they are range on how to do oral history, interviews with professors and grad students at Rutgers Newark, and of course, LGBTQ plus community members. Um, it went on, the podcast went on a little bit of a hiatus because of the pandemic and um, also being a grad student, I had to take my exams, um, but I'm planning on publishing new episodes very soon. So keep an eye out for that. Next. Um, and I just want to give you like uh, a little bit of a scope of Newark's LGBTQ plus history. So um, so far, like historians have, and thanks Mel for sharing that link. So far, historians have traced it back to the 19th century, but that's really, you know, it's not finished. Like we're still looking, we're still uncovering things, research is ongoing. Um, we have found Newark performers and entertainers like Reese LaRue pictured here, um, Albert Murphy, who owned queer clubs and managed clubs back into like the 1930s and 40s. Um, we have civil rights activists like Raymond Proctor, um, Carl Whitman, who went on to write the Gay Manifesto, um, which is known nationally, and Dr. Hilda Hidalgo. Um, there's also been a vibrant history of queer bar and clubs in Newark. One bar called Murphy's Tavern, which you see this like uh, uh, newspaper clipping here, it was targeted by the Alcohol and Beverage Commission for serving gays and lesbians in 1967. So the owners jar, uh, joined with two other New Jersey bars. One was in Asbury Park and one in New Brunswick. And um, they brought their case uh, to court. They brought it, they fought it all the way up to the New Jersey Supreme Court. And in the landmark victory, they actually won their case. They won the right, and this is, I'm quoting the judge here, but they won the right for well-behaved apparent homosexuals to congregate. Uh, so not great language, but a win nonetheless. Um, the history of, and the history of Murphy's Court case is a great example of smaller incremental victories that preceded the Stonewall uprising, which most people are more aware of, that happened in 1969. And also, when many of us think about Newark in 1967, a lot of folks were taught about the 67 Newark riots or rebellion as we better, as they are better known by now. Um, that's usually what comes to mind. So talking about Murphy shows another aspect of what was happening in that year in terms of marginalized people pushing for justice and equality. Next. So trans and non-binary stories on our site um, are great too. They challenge assumptions about the trans community and show how understandings of gender and language change over time. Um, and these understandings also change for trans people too. It's not just straight people that are learning new language. Um, it's all of us. And so um, I remember hearing uh, Ms. Pucci Revlon pictured here um, talk about not being rejected by her family when she came out to them sometime in the late 1960s as a teenager in Newark. And for me, that was really great um, as a queer and trans person myself to like hear about the possibility the, that, that families could be loving and accepting of LGBTQ plus people, even in times of less openness and understanding. Next. Newark also has an amazing history of HIV AIDS activism in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Newark activists like James Creedle pictured here um, joined together to help their community. They provided safer sex workshops. They ran underground pharmacies. They visited the sick and dying in hospitals and used their cars as ambulances for uh, the sick when official ambulances wouldn't pick up people with AIDS. Um, and so I feel like, you know, this is the sort of history that teaches students determination and courage and community love. I mean, this is what these folks were doing and embodying in the face of a deadly epidemic, which, you know, of course, we all unfortunately have uh, intimate experience with now. So next. Um, in 2003, uh, a young butch lesbian named Sakia Gunn was killed in a hate crime in Newark. 
And this uh, tragedy was a very pivotal moment in Newark's LGBTQ plus history because it galvanized Newark's LGBTQ community to fight for safe spaces for, um, for the community, but particularly for youth. Um, spearheading community organizing were Black queer women like Reverend Janice Jackson Jones. Um, Jones uh, established the Newark LGBTQ Community Center with the help of other Black queer women whose stories are in our archive. Um, and this space still exists today. It's now, I believe it's now on Market Street. It was at the Newark Library for a little while and then it moved to Market Street. Um, but they did this without help from, from city government. Um, they just... Um, got the community together and got it done. Next. Um, June Dal Burton was also moved by Sakia's murder to start Newark Pride in 2005. And Newark Pride is a week of events and celebrations. Um, it's also for different ages that culminates in the Pride March and Festival. Uh, Newark Pride also partnered with the city of Newark, which has led to the city raising the Pride flag at City Hall every year. And in 2009, Newark became the first city in New Jersey to form an LGBTQ plus advisory concerns commission, uh, which led to Essex County forming one as well. Next. Uh, the fight for marriage equality can also be told with a local lens. So Newark LGBTQ plus community members, Alicia Heath Toby and her wife, Sandra Toby Heath, were instrumental in the fight for marriage equality in New Jersey. They joined with seven other couples who were plaintiffs represented by Lambda Legal in a case known as Louis v. Uh, Lewis v. Harris. Their case was long fought and ultimately successful when they won access to civil unions for same-sex couples in New Jersey in 2006. Their story would be great to show uh, students how Black queer folks in New Jersey contributed to LGBTQ plus people gaining the right to marry. Uh, Alicia and Sandra even uh, made the cover of the New York Times, which I think is amazing. Next. So just a few practical notes. Um, when you navigate on our website and you go to the interview page, you can browse, if you um, if you look, you can browse the oral histories by name alphabetically. They're all there with their pictures and names and sort of like a glimpse at their bios. Um, but you can also sort them by clicking on one of the keywords at the top of the page that are in these, like I guess maroon bubbles, yeah. Um, and when you then um, navigate to an interview page, like say, for example, I have here Tracy Africa Norman's page, um, who, by the way, was the first uh, Black transgender model in the U.S. And in the 1970s, if you're around and dyeing your hair back then, you might have seen her on a box of Clairol hair dye. So um, but yeah, but anyway, so she, if you're looking at her page, for example, you can see that um, you'll see um, also keywords there that you can click on that will bring up um, other a list of other interviews that are on that same topic. The long bar that you see there is the audio file. You can click play on that. Once it's playing, you can sort of click to other points in the audio file. So if you want to fast forward ahead, you can just click to a later timestamp. Um, and uh, every interview has a PDF transcript that you can click on and download. It's a record of the audio conversation verbatim, um, but we have um, excised the a lot of the ums and uh, filler sounds to make you know make sure it's a more readable experience. And you can keyword search the transcripts using Control or Command F. Um, this way, you can find key topics and themes quickly. We also have other resources students could use for like research pro projects to help them out. So there's like um, a bibliography. We also have a couple of historical timelines. Um, we're also actually working on an educators hub for the Queer Newark website, um, TBD, TBD. But if you happen to have suggestions for it and our designers can do it, um, please contact us. We'll, we'll try to implement it to the best of our abilities. Um, we welcome teacher input, of course. So um, yeah, and with that, we're gonna go into some exercises. Um, all right, so I think we have a good amount of time. So, okay. 
So we're going to do this exercise together. Um, we're going to not, we're going to stay in this, in, we're going to stay together, do it together. Um, and if you um, have a pen or pencil nearby, that, that would be best. Um, so basically what this is, this uh, particular exercise, the Rainbow Oral History Identity Map, is an exercise that's tailored towards younger students. Um, so um, it's, it's a listening and sharing exercise. And so what you would do is choose, like say you're gonna um, choose an oral history, you're gonna choose one to play for your students that speaks to a theme or an idea or an identity perhaps that you want your students to learn about. Um, in this case, we're gonna listen to about two minutes of Tamara Fleming's oral history. And this is gonna be on the theme of self-esteem. So what you would be asking your students to do is cut out an image of Tamara, right? So say you can print out, you know, picture a couple pictures of her for them to cut out, glue it to the middle of a sheet, sheet of paper, then have them draw lines from the image to the edges of the paper and color them in. So they're like the rays, you know, of a rainbow. Um, for the purposes of us uh, trying to do this together, of course, you could just sort of draw a smiley face in a square perhaps and, um, have the the lines for the rays going out of it, or just jot, jot things down on a list if that's easier. So what I want you to do right now and uh, later ask your students to do is to listen to this clip. Um, I'm going to play it in a second. Write down any details that you hear, um, like for instance, you know, who is Tamara? Um, what did she, you know, what was she insecure about when she was a young girl? What kind of job does she have? Uh, what does she like about her job? Who does she help? And um, and then if you have some more time, you know, just a couple extra seconds, feel free to write down some things that you like about yourself or qualities you admire in a loved one. Um, so if you give me a second, I'm going to pull up her. Um, I'm going to pull up the clip. Okay, you can see that, right? Cool. All right, so I'm gonna hit play. And like I said, just jot down those things, you know, um, who she is, what she does, what she's insecure about, and uh, how does she help others? Yeah. Do you feel like then being a photographer kind of gives you a little bit of control? Yes, absolutely, absolutely it does. Because it's so funny because, um, the person that had that much internal conflict with what they look like um, from uh, not liking my lips, my eyes, my ears. I mean, I could, my hands, my fingers, my fingernails, my feet, my toes, my legs were too big. My thumbs were too big. I mean, just, you, I was just a walking ball of insecurity. And, um, and so, uh, I like in the way my eyebrows grew. I spent countless millions, millions and millions and trillions of seconds um, looking in the mirror, exploring me, like exploring it from this side, from that side. And so it's interesting that photography allowed me to help other people because in photography, it's me celebrating another person. I do a lot of coaching with someone else to talk to them about their own insecurities. And what I love about um, corporate and business photography is that I get a chance to see the insecurities in the largest, most well-respected CEO. And all of the ego and all of the accomplishments, they become 15 years old again when they're in front of the camera and it's my job to build them back up it's my job to tell them no you look so um yeah so you know I'm interested to hear you know either in the chat or if you want to chime in like uh you know what sort of things did you jot down 
Um, did you connect with anything that she said? Have you ever felt that way, you know, about yourself? Um, did she deal with her insecurities in a, in a productive way? Is she a positive role model? Um, that sort of thing, or, you know, what might your students get from an activity like this uh, in your view, or maybe you could other ways you could do this. Yeah, I feel that it's relevant for every student, no matter what you look like or identify, so true. Um, other people can usually look past our insecurities and see the strengths and beauty we don't see. I think it's important for students to realize that everyone has securities, yes. This is a woman at the top of her field now. She is, and she is helping people that are CEOs and they still have insecurities and that's okay. Um, and we can help each other um, get past that stuff and support each other. Students will be able to realize that everyone has insecurities in teens. It may help them feel less alone. Yes, I wish I had heard that when I was a young person. I was a very shy, very insecure. Um, she used those insecurities to find her passion. Yes, it could be a learning lesson. Like this is this is not just your insecurities. This is your strength to be able to see that in others and recognize when they're struggling with self doubt and bring them up. Um, I love the way she turned her own securities into an opportunity to use photography to coach others through theirs. Yes. Um, students can definitely relate to Tamara's insecurities, follow her example in seeking a healthy outlet and career to drive her passions and help her overcome those insecurities. Um, yeah, these are all, all so great. Um, yes. And, you know, Tamara actually did, she, she went to Haiti and she taught young girls in Haiti, um, how to, how to take photos, how to use a camera. Um, in terms of like, hey, we in America learn about Haiti and what we hear is that it's a terrible place, that it has no beauty. But I'm here with you young young girls and this we're at a beach and behind me is a mountain and you all young, young girls are, you're beautiful. So like when you use a camera, it's sort of like learning how to defocus negativity um, by putting something in focus, you blur out the rest. So you wanna put in focus the things that make you feel good and and the kind things people say and everything else can fade, right? Um, so she uses photography as a tool to help young people as well. Um, so I think, yeah, this is a great exercise in, in my estimation for like showing students that everyone has stuff about themselves that they wish they could change, that it's actually a strength um, to be able to help others um, go through the stuff and, and get, uh, get confidence. You can help other people get confidence. Um, you could also tell them, you know, what are some traits you admire in other people, your, like your friends and family. And I think talking about what they've heard and making connections um, to it in their own lives can be an effective classroom community building tool. Um, it's also a, a way to forge empathy and connection with other people. Um, and if you wanted to share a clip that spoke to a historical event, it can also obviously show how Ordinary people are historical figures, um, but I think ultimately um, one of the really sort of uh, not overt things, but aspects of this uh, exercise that I like is that it's positive representation to see a black queer woman who is at the top of her field. Um, and in fact, she's not only a photographer, but she runs a shelter for homeless LGBTQ youth with her wife in Essex County. Um, and she established the New Jersey LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce, which is an organization for queer and trans business owners. Um, so yeah, I only played you a very short clip, but overall her oral history talks about finding beauty, even when it doesn't seem like there's any beauty to be found and that beauty comes from the inside. Um, Kristen, I'm just gonna add one quick thing here, which I, I really love this activity and uh, well, actually two quick things. One is that um, I do think that if you're in the middle school classroom, this is quite a nice activity to do as like just a very introduction 
uh, to LGBT history and people and also identity mapping, just like in general, if that's a, a, a something that you use in your lessons. This is a nice way to introduce uh, identity mapping and it is very um, SEL aligned in terms of meeting the castle framework. If that those are integrations that you're making in your lessons, the social emotional learning skills that students are getting, um, evidence-based, extremely uh, important for students to develop these SEL skills. And we know that a lot of evaluations are dependent on SEL skills now. Um, and I just wanna emphasize quickly that like developing those quotes, what we used to look at as soft skills is something that of course, we're all focused on post or post-ish pandemic, wherever we are right now. And this is a nice way to, um, to really bring forward the things in our ecosystem and community that are make us feel like who we are, that chart, our identity that we use to sort of triangulate our ecosystem. And, um, you know, we want to make sure we're emphasizing again, the, those frameworks, the castle framework, which is like, you know, there's so many frameworks in education, but SEL is one in which we can really get to quite a bit in LGBTQ uh, history and education, because the marginalization aspect brings out emotions um, that are important to greet within your students. Um, back to you, Kristen. Thank you. Um, and I think, I guess, in the consideration of time, I'll just talk through the next exercise, if that makes sense to you, Mel. Um, how, how, the clip is like a minute or two? Yeah. Hmm, let's go for it. Okay. All right. So this uh, exercise would be more for like middle school, uh, I mean, sorry, high school students. Um, so I put in the chat a couple things that you would need or your students would need for this exercise, which is Aaron Fraser's oral history transcript and the following dates um, that are just nation national dates concerning the HIV AIDS epidemic. I just put three different ones in there. And so what you would do is have students like, or yourself, um, take a piece of paper, draw a line on one side of that line, you're writing down these uh, national dates in terms of a timeline. So, you know, 1981 CDC, the CDC uh, Centers for Disease Control noticed alarming increase in Carposi sarcoma and so on. Um, and then on the other side of the line, you would map out um, dates uh, and, and events in Aaron's life uh, that speak to HIV AIDS, right? Um, so I'm going to play a couple minutes of Aaron's um, oral history, but I want you to also be looking at the transcript. And when you're looking at the transcript, control uh, find for the term AIDS so that you can, because um, he's not going to say all the dates at the beginning of his, uh, his of his talking, but um, throughout his transcript, he mentions AIDS, and you might be able to add other stop other ticks on your timeline, um, and then um, yeah, and then we'll talk about it. So uh, one second, let me bring it up. So yeah, this is what his transcript looks like. Um, and then going over to his interview page, he has several interviews because he's a very interesting person. So we're going to listen to the fourth one um, just for a minute or two. For me, when HIV became prevalent, time-wise, I'll say 1980, maybe 84. You know, 80, we're gonna go with 1980. Okay. 1980. Um, we was doing the clubs, we was partying, but also during this particular time, HIV, far as those of us who were club heads and I was a club head. So acid was my thing, a mescaline, give me a mescaline. Uh, I could sit and party with the best of them all night long. Um, we went, uh, during that time we would do Zanzibar, we did Murphy's, you did First Choice, you had um, New York Better Days, you had the garage. You had on up here, you had Peter Rabbits, uh, Sneakers, Kellers, um, the Nickel Bar, uh, Club 77, which was in Jersey City off of, uh, I want to say it's around Grove Street. That's what I remember because it was, uh, it was actually 
in a the apartment building, the residential, but it was on the first floor. Oh. The the club. Well, it was more of a bar, but we. So, if you were to keep listening uh, or searching, you would find um, different dates where he talks about the AIDS epidemic and and sort of what his experience of it. You know, he was. Uh, when you first were tested, it came back positive. That's when I was 20. When we start the oral histories, we always ask them when and where you were born. So we would be able to figure out like, okay, he's 20 years old. He just came back, uh, tested positive for HIV AIDS. Um, so, you know, what year was this and how does this fit into the national, to the national timeline? Um, so um, I want to say too that, you know, depending, uh, keep in mind, these are uh, authentic stories. We're not censoring them. So if you're in a classroom where you feel like, hey, I don't want my students to hear about mescaline, um, you would probably just give them the transcript and redact that portion, right? Um, but um, nonetheless, I think that if you want to put in the timeline, like sort of thinking about, okay, like 1981 CDC sees Carponi Carposi sarcoma, which is skin cancer that um, is related to AIDS and they call it GRIDS, gay related immune deficiency. Um, but yeah, we see uh, Aaron is saying in 1980, it became more prevalent. Um, so I don't know, just they're thinking about this, like as you're mapping this out and maybe these dates do or do not align, um, you know, how might this um, generate conversations in your classroom about, you know, Aaron's experiencing experiences, whether they fit with the national events, you know, um, uh, like, is his memory accurate? And if it's not, does that actually matter even? You know, like, can we still get something out of oral histories when a person's um, memories are not exact, you know, on the date of what uh, the CDC or, you know, our national archives would say this date happened then? Um, uh, you know, we see, uh, of course, President Reagan doesn't mention the word AIDS in public until 86 when when he when Aaron saw it on the scene in 1980. Um, so like questions of, you know, um, government response and, um, you know, uh, how do how do queer people, how do gay people uh, respond to this sort of national ignoring of the problem? and so on and so forth. And then I think even with these mentions of the club, uh, Stacy says, I remember that club. Um, another like sort of alternate option you can do with an oral history like this is, is sort of giving students a map and having the map of historical clubs and bars on that sheet of paper and, uh, and sort of seeing what the landscape looked like at that time and how queer culture shaped the city or shaped an area where you live or wherever. Um, but yeah, feel free to put it, anything in the chat where you think uh, you could see how this might work in a classroom or how you might be able to use it, what students might get out of it. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'm going to, um, yeah, I'm just going to close out by saying, I think it, it, again, it enables like a close listen. I think listening skills are very important, especially in today's day and age for students who are constantly being bombarded with fast quick things and don't stop to really hear and good connections on how individual people become historical actors and it can connect to these larger events. Their lives can connect to these larger events. Um, but I'm going to pass it back to, to Mel for some share outs. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. That's, that was awesome. I, I really appreciate hearing those oral histories every time. Um, I, I, I saw a couple things in the chat box. So I want to open us up for questions, uh, reactions, and, you know, maybe just further digging that folks want to do about LGBT history right now. Um, and I'd like you to, if you want to ask a question, put it in the chat box or, or feel free to unmute. Um, and I want to dedicate our last few minutes to just answering as many questions as possible um, in terms of your uh, anticipation of integrating resources, if you have any questions specifically about or reactions to the activities we just walked through, what you might integrate, where or how, I'm hoping we can just close up with an informal discussion. So feel free to unmute yourself now and, and ask any questions to myself or Scott or Kristen. Um, you can type in the chat box as well. I'd like to hear your voices. It's always tough to do these online when I don't see you and, and hear you.
I'll just say great presentation, everybody. Thank you for uh, sharing this with us. It's very useful. Um, no problem. Thank you. I don't know who that was because I can't, I, it didn't pop up on my screen, but it was Chris, uh, the guy that asked you questions earlier. Okay, yeah. cool. Thanks, Chris. Um, I appreciate that. Um, thank you very much. Is there any other children's books are a good way? Yep. Jasmine, I agree with that very much. There are a, a bevy of resources in this, um, additional resources guide that we put into the, um, Draw the Google document. I'm trying to pull it over on my screen. You can see my tech skills. So these additional resources are like, you know, there's a lot of them. And we've, I mean, we've cleared all of these, right? Like Scott and myself have been using these for years. Um, there are some wonderful resources that already exist for you to look through. This is a good collection you should keep on hand um, and make sure that you are, you know, sort of sifting through it uh, at various times when you're planning your scope and sequence at the beginning of the year or during the summer for your, your year to come. There are a lot of wonderful oral histories. I saw a couple of people put like making gay history into the chat box. Um, as well as the Newark Oral History Projects, some can function side by side, just like really wonderful um, oral histories where students can again hear the voices of real people who were impacted by history. Um, so I, I would just impress upon you to like engage with any of these resources that you um, might find fit to uh, put into your scope and sequence. Um, are there any other questions? I actually do have a question. I currently mm -hmm. teach um, high school math. Um, I have a lot of trouble um, incorporating it. Um, um, like, for example, I know that there was recently a movie, um, there was like math involved, I forgot the name of the movie, but it was so good. Um, and I could see the incorporating that, but that's pretty much, like I get stuck. That is a tough one. Um, that is a really tough one. I think that like your, so I think we should, A, we could talk more about this at another point, like you can email us and maybe I can try to find a couple of resources that are gonna be helpful for you. Dialing down on specific people, I think is the best way for you to go. Um, I could see like making a connection to like Sally Ride um, in math, in your, in your math class, who was, uh, I think the first female astronaut. Is that correct, Kristen? Am I making that up? She was right. And she's also LGBTQ. And so I could see a few, like really, what grades are you, Ruth? Uh, I am from ninth to 12th. So I have okay, all so of them. You could highlight some individual people, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's that st Alan Turing. Alan Turing. <laughs> so yeah, the great that movie. He was a uh, gay man who was um, God. What did he? He was the code breaker for World War II. And there's a really right. great. Um, he cracked the Nazi code. Yeah, basically father of the modern computer. Yeah, and and also you could perhaps I depend. I I didn't hear uh, the grade level, but perhaps talking about how you know, power, you know, a lot of LGBTQ stuff like is a discussion of of how power operates too in our society. And so numbers aren't absent from that. There is power in numbers, um, how we, you know, how we do statistics, how we count people um, and do not count people and that sort of thing, I think too could perhaps be a lesson. Sounds good. Yeah. I'm, I'm high school, by the way. So that does, it does work. Thank you so much. Sure, that was a good question. Oh, sorry. I was just going to add that um, I've had math teachers remind me that they're able to be successful just by creating more inclusive word problems. Like when you're giving a word problem, instead of saying like, you know, John and Sarah, you know, wanted to take their family for vacation, like just make it John and David wanted to take their family for vacation. You know what I mean? And there's kind of ways that you can craft in an inclusive curriculum, even when you're not necessarily highlighting like, you know, our gay mathematician of the no, week. yeah I, <laughs> I, actually, um, I actually do incorporate that because um I'm a, my district is very um filled with a lot of hispanics so I do use hispanic like names like I, I use my own students name maybe different periods uh, but not, not the same class so they don't feel like singled out or anything but I do use names that they're known and they're used to to um to hear but I never thought about that that's actually pretty good at it thank you thank you We have time for like one more question if um before we wrap, if anyone else has anything. I 
I don't have a question, but someone earlier posted a question asking about resources for teaching US history, um, I think 1750s until reconstruction. And um, there is some research that I found just on my own about uh, LGBTQIA plus people serving in the Civil War. Um, and so like, and that was something that I just found on my own uh, because I wanted to find it. So whatever group anybody wants to include in their history, just Google it sometimes and the resources will be there. Um, but in the Civil War in particular, um, there were both gay and trans people who served in the Civil War. Um, some who identified that way and some who didn't, but they expressed their gender in opposition to the sex that they were assigned at birth. Um, men would go on dates with each other uh, because of the lack of women who were there, um, just to continue having a social life while they were at war and sitting in their camps. Um, there were people who dressed as the um, a, a, a gender that didn't match their sex that they were assigned at birth on, you know, women who dressed as men and men who dressed as women. Um, there, yeah, are, are primary sources even. And if you can't find them on your own, email me, jlockquintano at carneyschools.com and I'll send you what I found. Um, but yeah, there are primary sources of people even like writing in their letters and diaries about experiencing that. So um, hopefully that, is that yeah. at least one resource that you can use? <laughs> No, that was really a really great summary, Jessica. I want to I I point out too, to that point, uh, Revolution New Jersey is organizing for the semi-quincentennial coming up soon, 2026, and they will have very inclusive stories too that uh, that include LGBTQ histories um, to, to keep a lookout for that in their announcements. Great. Um, yeah. I, I just scrolled, by the way, to this page. Sorry, Scott. Yes, I think there's a resource you're going to speak to. Um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Melissa. No, I was just going to thank Jessica for sharing that. I think there's also some resources out there um, about, um, uh, how, about how um, uh, uh, men expressed gender roles differently or tra <laughs> during, um, during the gold rush era, era when there weren't as many women around. Um, and um, uh, same-sex camaraderie and loved and gender roles were expressed in different ways. I don't think there's any of that in this particular resource list, but I think that um, there are resources out there on that. Um, and I see that you're highlighting what I was going to say, this um, really great lesson plan on Charlie um, Parkhurst, who was a, a stagecoach driver um, during the gold rush era out, out West and was uh, uh, born biologically female, but um, <laughs> presented um, as male during that era. Um, so there are a number of um, um, interesting resources on this list that um, uh, take place during the, the 19th century that could potentially fit, fit into your, into your uh, curriculum if you teach that era. Um, I'm sorry, did you want to add anything, Melissa? No, I don't, not necessarily. No, I, I put that resource in the chat box and um, I know that we are over time. So I want to close up, but invite people who want to continue the conversation to stay on if you wish to do so. Um, we'll be here for uh, a oh, minute. Sorry. Yeah, I wanted to mention something. Um, so someone to look into during the Reconstruction era um, is the relationship between Walt Whitman and Oscar Wilde um, and also uh, Louisa May uh, Alcott was transgender. So those are both during um, reconstruction post of war if you wanted to look into them. That's fascinating. Um I had I did not know a few of those things. Um and so thank you for that. And I do think we have a couple of Walt Women lesson plans in that in the resource list. Um it's a great, great way to bring in LGBTQ history to either an English lesson or a history lesson. Um when you're talking about the 19th century. Zoe, any closing words while we wrap up? 
No, I just wanted to say thanks again to you, Melissa. Um, this has just been amazing. And Scott and Kristen and Danae, I mean, it's been really terrific to have your um, insights and kind of these hands-on materials. I'm going to do that lesson with the um, timeline. That was great. Can we can we gain access to yours or do we have to just copy it and make our own, do you think? No, I can share. I'm happy to share. Okay. It. Yeah, share it and I'll I'll push it out to everyone else so they can we'll put it on the program for you. But let me wrap up just by saying a huge thank you to our presenters and an absolutely phenomenal thank you to those of you who joined us today. We have a ton of teachers. I know some of you, some of you are new, and I see a lot of MSU students here as well. So those are our future teachers. Thank you for taking the time um, and putting the work into learning how to do this and how to be a better and more inclusive teacher. We really appreciate it. Uh, so we have links in the chat. I'll drop them there one more time that include um, a PD certificate, uh, the program for today, and a link to our next workshop, which will be on Holocaust education in March. So that's it for today. If you have any questions, please uh, stick around. Otherwise, have a great night and thank you for coming. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.